Good evening and welcome everyone. I hope you're all safe and well. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Luke Hatton. I'm the president of Oxford Climate Society and a fourth year engineering undergraduate student at Oxford, looking to specialize in low carbon technologies. Oxford Climate Society is a part of Oxford University, aiming to develop the next generation of informed climate leaders. In addition to our weekly speaker events, we run educational programs throughout the year, including our award-winning School of Climate Change, which this year is teaching over 1,500 students from all across the world. We also run the world's largest student climate journal, Anthroposphere, and we are currently working with the university to develop net zero policies and to incorporate climate into the curriculum. The theme of today's event is COP26, lessons to take from the response to COVID-19. The COP26 conference in Glasgow later this year has been described by many to be the world's best chance to get runaway climate change under control and will be the first moment when countries update their plans and targets for emissions reductions. However, it's been disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has already delay delayed the conference for a year and has caused some national leaders and activists difficulty in attending the conference in person. Climate action will have to contend with the world's focus on economic recovery from the pandemic's impacts, with the need to control the virus's spread having forced many countries' governments into crisis mode. The COVID-19 pandemic has also forced governments to take rapid and substantial action, pushing the boundary for what has been considered acceptable government policies. Climate action will also require, require governments to encourage rapid and effectual behavioural shifts, and science has a key role to play in guiding these actions. But to what extent has COVID-19 changed the role of science and engineering in guiding policy? And what lessons can we take from the national and global response to COVID-19 to the COP26 conference in November? And finally, will these lessons lead to effective climate action, or has the pandemic caused too much disruption to global agreements on climate targets? To provide insight onto this topic, we are delighted to be joined by the UK government's chief scientific advisor and head of the government's science and engineering profession, Sir Patrick Valance. Patrick was president R&D at GlaxoSmithKline from 2012. Prior to this, he was senior vice president for medicines, discovery and development. He joined the company in May 2006 as head of drug discovery. He's a member of the GlaxoSmithKline board and the corporate executive team. He has over 20 years experience of basic and clinical research and was a consultant physician in the NHS. His research spanned from work on medicinal chemistry and structural biology through to cellular work, study in humans and use of large electronic health record databases. Since 2018, as government's chief scientific advisor, he's been responsible for providing scientific advice to the prime minister and to members of cabinet, advising the government on aspects of policy on science and technology, and ensuring and improving the quality and use of scientific evidence and advice in government. We're gonna start this event with a speech from Sir Patrick, which will then be followed by some prepared questions before opening it up to questions from you, the audience at the end. If you have any questions at all for our speaker, please write them in the live stream chat at the right hand side of YouTube. So thank you very much, Patrick, for joining us this evening. I'll pass switch swiftly on to, to you. Thanks, Luke. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak here. And uh, I think this is a very good time to be asking the question, what are the lessons from these past two years in COVID that might be applied to climate? I'm gonna focus on this from a science and engineering angle. And I'm going to start with the premise that the climate challenge that we face is by far the biggest challenge for all of us. It's a long-term durable challenge which needs sustainable answers. And in a way it's a much, much, much bigger challenge than the pandemic was, however big that was, because this is gonna go on for a long period. I want to tackle this thinking about the COVID response with five real headings. The first is international aspects. The second is data. The third is systems. The fourth is behavior. And the fifth is what is the link between science engineering, policy and operations. But let me start by saying the COVID response was ultimately multidisciplinary. 
it needed research and scientists from a range of disciplines, biomedical, cellular, virology, immunology, behavioral science, engineers, vaccinologists, people who understood robotics, all sorts of different angles needed to come in to thinking about the science challenge that COVID presented. And one of the things that we did quite early on was to establish that this was something that needed all of the funding agencies to pull in the same direction and to make sure that the research funders were putting money into the right things, whether that was big clinical trials, whether it was starting to get the vaccines work off the ground properly, or whether it was individual projects that needed to read out in time to inform policy. And ultimately, we pulled that together as what we call the national core studies, seven themes of research questions that simply had to be answered in order to give policy input. Similarly, the SAGE process, which fed into the uh, government advice system, was multidisciplinary. It involved hundreds of scientists. I mean, SAGE itself was often 50 or 60 people on a, on a call, but there were hundreds of scientists behind that from many, many disciplines. So that notion of interdisciplinarity, multidiscipline approach is, of course, exactly relevant to climate. And it's not just relevant to, adaptate, uh, to mitigation, it's relevant to adaptation too. And adaptation, of course, is going to be a big theme and something that's going to be important for COP26. So my starting point is this is a big, wide scientific and engineering challenge. It needs people from lots of disciplines to work together, and it needs the questions to be well articulated. So let's go to the first of my five themes, which is international. International collaboration has been absolutely critical during COVID. I have calls every couple of weeks with science advisors from across Europe. We've had calls with Tony Fauci in the States, people in New Zealand, people in Singapore, South Korea, right the way through. We've had regular contact with our colleagues. That's been important for all sorts of reasons, not because we can't all read the scientific literature, but because you pick up some sort of things that isn't in things that aren't in the scientific literature or things that people just know or things that they've done. So a very networked science and engineering response is crucial. That has to be underpinned by data and data sharing across nations was important right from the beginning actually, when China sequenced the virus early on and shared the sequence of the virus, that was an important step. And of course, these are equally true for what we're talking about for climate. The other sort of things in terms of collaboration, which are less obviously sort of tangible and scientific are sometimes you find that you've all got the same view and that view when expressed together can be much more powerful in terms of the recipients, i.e. the politicians and the decision makers than if you're just saying it on your own. It's also important because the solutions to COVID across the world needed some form of equitable answer. It's not okay to just sort the problem out in developed countries and rich countries and have the virus spreading throughout Africa or in other places where people will continue to suffer. And indeed we all suffer until we're all safe. And that notion of equitable approaches and applicable approaches that are sensible in resource poor settings is of course true for climate as well, as are the need to develop talent, resources, training and sharing expertise. So that international dimension, which actually the climate community has been extraordinarily good at, has been ahead of the game in many ways, is going to be crucial as we go into this next stage. The difference I think is that most of the collaboration has been around climate science and mitigation it's going to have to also be true for adaptation. So international is my first point. The second is around data. And at the beginning of the COVID um, uh, pandemic in the UK, we didn't have good data. We didn't have good data flows from various sources. And we certainly didn't have good ways of integrating those data and being able to feed them into um, mathematical models and other things early on. It, was, it took a while to get the data flows right. I think where climate has been ahead of the game is they've had data flows absolutely superb, again, for climate science, 
which have been shared and have gone into ensemble models and other things which have allowed a much greater sharing of output in terms of what that means for climate. Again, once it's great for climate science, it's going to be even more important to do that for adaptation as well. And even for climate science, you can see that as we enter this period of real international response to the climate emergency, the ability to get greater granularity on modeling is going to require greater granularity of data collection. And that's something that's going to become, I think, increasingly important. How do you get this from the scale we are now down to a much smaller scale of geographical prediction? That's going to be important for planning. It's going to be important for understanding how to be resilient, because whatever happens, we're facing an increase in temperature. And of course, we need to limit that. But we aren't going to limit it to zero. You know, we're aiming for 1.5 as the international response. That is a you know, situation we find ourselves in that will lead to changes which we're going to need to adapt to. So our ability to understand this at a more granular level will be important. And then two other points on data. The first is that in COVID, it was important to share public and private data. So some data is accessible to everybody. Some data come from private companies, whether that's rail companies or bus companies looking at mobility, or whether it's companies that enable you to understand shopping patterns and so on. And these data become really important in order to be able to understand what was going on and monitor what's going on. The same is true and will be true in the climate space. If we can't accurately get the data that allows us to monitor some of the behaviors and responses, and indeed some of the physical elements as well, not all of which is in the public sector, then we will be trying to do this with one hand behind our back. So the ability to access, utilize, share, and integrate both private and public data is crucial. And the other point, which I think is a big lesson from the pandemic, is at the beginning of the pandemic, I think, politicians around the world were not used to looking at data and were not used to looking at graphs and other forms of data visualization. Similarly, I don't think that scientists were necessarily terribly good at presenting those in a way that was accessible to a policymaker. And again, the climate world has been good at this. I mean, the reports that come out are generally very accessible, but we are now dealing with a group of politicians right the way on the, around the world that have every single day been looking at data and every single day been looking at data visualization graphs and trying to understand them. They've all had to get their heads around exponential curves. They've had to get their heads around things that you know were just not the bread and butter of a political day. So I think the two lessons there are, first of all, we have a group of politicians that are more attuned to looking at these things. That's something we need to take advantage of. Secondly, we have a group of scientists and engineers around the world who've actually got used to presenting this in a way that politicians can understand. And that's really important because there's no good giving information out to politicians that they aren't going to understand or they're not going to take time to understand. I mean, you know, they're clever enough to understand it, but you've got to put it in a way that is accessible and relevant. And that's, I think, become something that people across the world, scientists across the world have become uh, really used to. So that's my second point around data. My third point is around whole systems. And um, it's very clear right the way through that the COVID response has had to be a whole systems response. And you can think of lots of examples of that. Um, you take the difficult issue of lockdowns. I mean, lockdowns aren't neutral in terms of the effects on all sorts of other aspects of lives, other aspects of the economy, other aspects of health. The very fact that the virus affected every walk of life is a total systems problem. It wasn't the remit of the Department of Health only to deal with COVID. Every single department had to think about aspects, whether it was education, whether it was housing, whether it was transport, whether it was the treasury. And the same, of course, is absolutely true for net zero. And indeed, this is now sort of bedded into the system. And so this is going to be true across the world, that this is a whole systems problem that requires 
a systems engineering mindset in order to look at the whole thing. And indeed, uh, the, the Council for Science and Technology, which is a, an advisory group that, that I at that time co-chaired with Dame Nancy Rothwell from Manchester, that uh, gives advice to the prime minister. Um, before the COVID crisis, crisis so two and a half years ago, we, we wrote a letter on uh, net zero. And one of our big recommendations was around systems approaches to this. And we said, government, and this will be true for governments across the world, and I think will be a key thing for COP26 to think about, need to strengthen the institutions and governance frameworks and leadership structures that are needed to galvanize action. So that's important, to galvanize action. The second thing is to develop analytical capability and information flow and reporting, including data visualization. So what is the sort of data system you're gonna have in place to see your system and to understand that when you tweak one part of it, you're gonna affect another part of it. And you, know, you can think of examples, you think about hydrogen, it's not a problem just for heating, it's a problem for transport, it's a problem for heavy goods vehicles and so on. If you slice that up as a government and you only see it in individual slices, you find that none of them have got an economical benefit and therefore you end up with a problem of nobody wanting to move. So systems problem, and actually there's an interesting systems problem in, in housing between infection control and net zero, which is um, all of the push on housing for the past few years has been on heavily insulated houses in order to stop heat loss. Of course, heavily insulated houses, if they haven't got the right ventilation, are very poor for infection control. So you can see, you know, thinking of these things across boundaries and systems is important. And the third piece of advice on net zero was to maximize the contribution of technology, mobilize finance and galvanize an international response. And I think those three recommendations from that report remain absolutely correct today. They are highly relevant to net zero um, and actually they were quite applicable to how one had to think about COVID as well. And indeed, if you think about one of the things in the UK that I think went well in the COVID response, it was the formation of the vaccines task force. What was that about? It was about understanding a goal and the goal was very simple. We must have vaccines and we need to do that. We need to invest in innovation. We must accept that we don't understand what the answer is going to be. In other words, the answer could have been it's not possible to make a vaccine, but we had to put a number of options on different um, vaccine technologies in order to be able to choose. And that was not something that could be run solely out of the civil service as it currently exists. It needed experts from industry in manufacturing, it needed academics, it needed people from the civil service, it needed people who understood contracts in order to pull that together with a clear objective and drive it forward to a goal. And it was cross vital. So I think this systems approach with clear accountable leadership is going to be important for governments across the world and is going to be a crucial thing in COP26 to ask the question, what is the process to get to your goals? How are you going to do that? And you know, it's a bit boring and, you know, I'm a scientist and engineer, but at some point you have to sort of say, how are you going to do this? How precisely are you going to go there? What's the map to get there? And what is the variance in your map that you need to take into account? My fourth point is around behaviour. And it's the greatest unknown. And it was the greatest unknown in COVID. And if you look at where we are now in COVID, two big unknowns. One is human behavior. How quickly are we gonna go back to pre-pandemic behavior? And the second is waning immunity. But actually, if you take the behavior side of this, it's a big swing factor. At the moment, children are pretty much back to pre-pandemic levels of contact. Adults are still about 30% down. If adults go back to 100% or 120%, that has a huge, huge impact on what happens to the pandemic. And these are very difficult things to look at. Of course, it's the same for net zero. Our behaviors are gonna be crucial. You know, what we choose to do in terms of travel, how we choose to eat, how we choose to think about our energy use in our house. These things are going to sway the, our ability to get to net zero. There are 29 million homes 
in the UK, 1 million currently are low carbon. 28 million have got to move to low carbon. That's a massive behavioral change, plus of course, a technological challenge. So how we make our choices, and frankly, how government can help make the green choice, the easy choice across the world is I think one of the things that is going to be a key theme at COP26. And then my final major point is around docking points. So science and engineering advice, and there's been plenty of it in the climate space for many, many years, just as there's been plenty of it in the COVID space, doesn't make a difference if it doesn't dock into the right part of government. It needs to dock into policymakers and it needs to dock into operational activities in a way that they can pick it up and use it. Now that may be obvious, but it's not straightforward. And there's often a tendency to say, I've given my advice, I've done my job, I wipe my hands, it's over to you. But if that advice has landed in a way that it's not heard or it's not understood or it can't be acted on, you haven't done your job. So making sure that the advice is understood, the uncertainty around that advice is understood, because very seldom is advice in either climate or in COVID absolute. It's usually this is what we think, and this is the boundary of uncertainty around this. This is when we may know more, and these are the options and what they might do in terms of action. So I think that's going to be important, expressing uncertainty, expressing choices, being able to help governments, in the case of climate, get metrics that they can follow and track and know whether, whether they're on the right path or not. And the metric can't be 40 years off. The metric has to be now. The other key point of this docking is that very often governments are full of very clever people and very well-meaning people in, in the civil service who want to do a good job, but it doesn't always have technical expertise. And many of these questions are highly technical. So as well as the science advice, there's a need for technical advice and engineering advice into the system to say, actually, when you're looking at these options, you really need to understand that this one is technically very difficult. This one is technically much easier. And these are the sorts of things you might come up against. And then, you know, my final general point is that in COVID, there was an urgency. And that urgency was obvious. You could see it and people could feel it. And it affected all of us. And we all knew somebody who'd become ill, seriously ill sometimes. People knew people who died, of course. That creates an extraordinary sense of both community and urgency, which means things can happen. In climate, 2050 sounds like a long way away. And yet the reality is if we don't make some of the choices in the next decade, we can't scale the solutions to be in place by 2050. So this decade is a decade of R&D action, narrowing options, developing new things that might change our view of the world, but importantly, doing R&D that allows things to be scaled, developed, deployed at scale so that we can end up with solutions that can actually be in place. All of that's got to be done as well, considering the impact on nature. And that comes back to the systems point, to think about climate without thinking about nature is going to lead us into problems. We have to do this in an integrated way. So the urgency is real, it's something that scientists need to express in the right way because this doesn't have the same obvious immediacy as COVID, but actually it needs the same degree of focus, leadership, integration, private and public sector, public action, behavioral change, and a systems approach to get it right. So I think there are many similarities and it leads into COP26 where the overarching aim for sure is to make sure the world stays focused on the need to limit this to 1.5 degrees centigrade. And we shouldn't view that as something that is either easy or frankly, a fantastically great outcome. I mean, it's still 1.5 degrees, it's still problematic. And in doing so, make sure that we focus not only on that mitigation, but on the adaptation solutions that will be so important for resilience.
Luke, I hope that gives a bit of a flavour for this and I'm happy to go into questions. Has been really great. Thank you for such an interesting and insightful um, speech. Uh, and really, as for my first question, I'd like to pick up on that uh, docking points that you mentioned. So, as as you mentioned, climate change has been a known problem for several decades now. Scientists have warned about it since the 1980s. So, I'm interested to hear about what barriers you think it faces to translating the need for action on the climate crisis into effective policy. So, sort of the reverse fitting into these docking points, but what barriers does it face, even if we do get to these docking points to translate into it? Well, I think, I think, yeah, I, th I think there is, there, is a docking, there is a docking point question because it affects every department. So the yeah. first question is, are we clear in every single department what the docking point is? Are we clear that every regulatory authority has net zero in its mission? So when we're regulating, you know, because there are a limited number of things government can do. And one of the things they can do is regulate. But as we regulate, are those regulators thinking about the net zero angle as a primary concern? Because if not, they may regulate a perfectly sensible thing to do that pulls in another direction. So it's an important docking point to think about the levers that make a difference, as well as, of course, the financial ones. And if politicians view, view the goal of net zero as predominantly about spending, they will approach you with one mindset. If they view it predominantly as about generating the new businesses and opportunities of the future, whilst also spending, it has a different tone to it. So I think how we, how we frame this becomes really important in terms of how people are going to pick up and deal with it. But I think this is a whole government problem. It is no longer the purview of one single department. It's every single department that needs to have a very clear, ambitious goal around net zero. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. And yeah, I definitely agree that when we're thinking about how we're how we're talking about the recommendations from science and policy science on on climate change, what we heard is that it is important how you frame it. When we one of the things we heard from Lorraine Whitmarsh before in one of our summer events is that um, she's a social psychologist and it's important to speak to people's values and um, cultures when we're talking about trying to convince them on climate action, why it's important to reach these net zero targets. Um, so I definitely feel that's a, that's a really important point um, when it comes to government and framing it. But it's also important for us as individuals. Yes, I mean, exactly. What do we have to do? I mean, What's interesting is that I think there are very few people now who don't want to sort of be part of this. I mean, most people you meet know there's a climate crisis and would like to do something to help. They're much less certain about what they need to do personally or how to do it. And I'll give you an anecdote. When we um, moved house um, about four years ago, I wanted to... Um, and we live in London, I wanted to think about alternatives to gas boiler and how we could do it. It's actually pretty difficult, or it was then, it's easier now. It was pretty difficult to find somebody who actually knew what you can do in a city where you haven't got the land to do sort of ground source heat pump or you're not doing a new build. And so I think there are lots of examples like that where people would like to do something and they're not sure how to go about doing it. And so I think there's a lot that government can start to do to try and make it easier to make the green choices. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I guess the other side to that as well is not only what people know that they can do, but whether they're able to do it or not. For example, when my family were looking at getting a, a new boiler when the old one broke down, looking at the costs difference between a heat pump and then just a, a very efficient gas boiler, I guess that's the other side to the problem in that respect. Yeah. Um, I'd like to move on. You touched upon um, personal choices and what we can do to contribute to climate action. So many of our audience will be worried about the climate crisis and feel somewhat helpless at the scale of the problem. So I'm interested to ask what, in your view, is the best way to contribute to effective climate action? And this is both through our personal lives, but also professional as well. Um, many of our audience will be students. So thinking about careers and 
professional lives. Yeah, I think I think this is um, a series of sort of millions of micro actions that make a difference. And of course, each little thing that we do isn't on its own going to make a difference. But when you multiply that by millions, it makes a big difference. So I think that climate awareness and whether it's you know energy conservation because you are at the simplest level turning your lights off and and um, uh, and keeping your heating down a bit and insulating your house and making choices about how you travel and using sort of cycling and walking where you can and making choices about your diet um, where you choose to eat less of certain types of meat and so on. These are all choices which multiplied by millions make quite a significant difference. And so I think those are the things that, that, that we can do. I mean, it's very difficult for us as individuals to change the way buildings done with cement, except through the arguments we can make and so on, but we can't actually control it. But there are many things we can control and however trivial they might seem, they're not because they're being multiplied by millions. And I think that's important. And of course, the challenges that we face in the UK, and it's easy to say, well, the UK is only a small percentage of the total world's emissions, but also there's something about doing it right in your own backyard if you're then going to try and help people to do it in other places as well, which is what, of course, we should be trying to do. Of course, yeah, that, that's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and a final prepared question before we move on to uh, the audience questions. So do you think that the pandemic has led to a change in the way the public perceives science experts? And how do we preserve this when we're thinking about responding to the climate crisis? Well, well I think it has, and history tells you it always has. So in other words, if you go back to all pandemics, they change the perception of science and society, and it doesn't last forever. So we've got a window of opportunity, and I've talked about some of them, which is we've got politicians now who are used to looking at data and understand the consequences of um, what data can tell you and what options it gives. So that's a really good starting point. We've got a public who are engaged in this and have been used to looking at quite difficult concepts and trying to make their minds up as to what they think. Um, you know, we've had a, um, a plethora of armchair epidemiologists who, who've, who've evolved during the crisis. And so I think there is, a, there is a, and we know there are lots of children who are very engaged in both this and medicine now. So that's all great stuff, but we know it doesn't last. And so there's a window to really take advantage of that. And also, of course, to move us all onto the next thing, which is exactly this question of climate and of course of biodiversity, and to make sure that we harness that enthusiasm and knowledge to tackle the next problem, even though we are not yet out of the COVID crisis. You know, it's really important. We don't think this is over. It's not over yet. It's in its later stages, particularly in countries which have been able to vaccinate, but it's not over. That's brilliant. Thank you. So moving on to the audience questions, we had the first one. Just as COVID-19 and SARS COVID-2 scientific papers were made publicly available by the journals, should we and can we make a call to make climate change and earth science papers also available for public access? You think I, that would help with I think it's a great idea, actually. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. You know, I'm 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 totally in favor of open access publication. So yeah. Yes, is my general point to all of the scientific papers, but I think you're right. We put a specific call out early in the pandemic that all these papers should be public and the journals responded. Um, and, you know, one would hope that in climate science and indeed adaptation science relating to this, uh, the same might be true. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of things are open access now. And of course, a lot of um, universities uh, will have a repository where you can get the information anyway, even if it's not in the final uh, uh, journal version so a lot of that's there but I you know I'm I'm, I'm in favor of open access yeah definitely I think I think that would be great so do you feel that action at COP26 can tackle both the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis or do you feel trade-offs will need to be made well I think there's, there's obviously been uh, um, uh, the uh, COP15 biodiversity uh, um, conference which dealt specifically in, in biodiversity and and COP26 is dealing sort of specifically in the climate aspect, but it will have aspects of uh, biodiversity there as well. I think it's quite important actually that COP26 focuses mainly on the 1.5 degrees centigrade and the responses needed both to get there and to be resilient al along, along the way. Um, but I think increasingly everyone's going to have an eye to knowing that 
if you do that and you don't take into account nature, you're going to solve one problem and give yourself another big problem. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, do you think so? Do you think that it's realistic to expect um, action from governments around the world to limit to 1.5 degrees at COP26? Do you think that they'll reach that agreement or do you think it'll just be more talk? And if so, what do you think that we can do to pressure them to make more ambitious goals? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. And of course, it's ultimately a political question. And this is where I think it's quite important that as scientists and engineers, what we do is lay out the science and engineering as clearly as we can. So people can't say, I didn't know, yeah. or I didn't understand. And it's important people understand. And we recognize that whilst technologies are solutions for much of this, there is no magic technology that's gonna come along in 10 years time and solve it, it's now that we need to get on with things. There will be, of course, advances in new technologies, but we shouldn't rely on those. And the technologies we have need to be ones that you can apply in resource poor settings. So some countries are gonna struggle more than others simply because of the settings they're in. So whether, you know, politically this all ends up wrapped in a bow, I don't know, but I do know that from a scientific perspective, it's absolutely what we need to do. We should not shy away from sticking to 1.5 degrees centigrade. I don't believe there are scientists around the world in climate science who, who, would, who would want to disagree with that. I don't believe that chief scientific advisors around the world would shy away from that ambition. I think it's tough for some countries. They're gonna find it difficult. We're all gonna find it difficult. And actually that's where it comes to how we can help across other countries in order to make it easier in some places for people to do it where it's difficult. But I think, I can't predict what's going to happen. I hope we get a, a, a good outcome because that's the right answer um, in terms of, you know, where we think things are scientifically. Yeah, definitely. I, I very much hope that too. Uh, I guess touching upon that sort of ease for governments and how quickly societies can move um, in response to a crisis, do you feel that conversations leading up to COP26 have led you to believe that the climate crisis is being treated with the same amount of urgency as COVID amongst world leaders? Well, I think all, all world leaders have been completely um, dominated by COVID and, and it's not surprising and um, they had to be. I think it has, it has focused minds on these things, these crises being things that can derail all sorts of political ambitions. And so to fail to focus on them doesn't actually then give you the freedom and license to do all the things you wish you could do. The lesson is you've got to focus on the real crisis in order to do the other things you want to do as well. And I think that's very, you know, that'll be top of the mind of politicians. They'll know that. So I, I suspect, I don't know this because we, you know, I haven't seen any, any evidence of this, but I suspect if you say, are oh, leaders coming into this COP more acutely aware of the need to act than they were two years ago, I suspect the answer is yes, they are. And they've also learned how difficult it is to act. You know, having big responses to big international crises requires a very systematic approach and it's not easy. And it requires all the levers of government to pull in the right direction. And it requires huge input from society. And it requires huge input from the private sector. And that, I think, is you know, one of the things that, that I hope comes out of COP26, this notion that you've got to work out the mechanisms of levers to turn an ambition into a clear roadmap into a plan of action that can actually be operationalized. Definitely, yeah. Needs more than just ambition. We need that clear route to how we're going to reach these targets. And I guess in, in a similar vein, the next question, we're talking about behavioral changes and changes in social norms. So the response to the climate crisis will require many behavioral changes and changes in social norms. 
And what have we learned from the response to COVID about people's willingness and ability to make these changes in the future? And do you think there's fatigue already in making these large life changes? Well, I think the, the um, you know, clear observation from COVID is that people are remarkably sensible and want to do the right thing. And the vast majority of people, nearly everybody, you know, came on board with all the difficult things that had to be done. And no, they didn't get tired of it. I mean, everyone, of course, wants to go back to normal, but people understood what they needed to do. And so I think the lesson from COVID is, you know, the public, surprise, surprise, is actually resilient, is determined to do the right thing, can act sensibly in the common interest and wants to do so. And I believe the same will be true um, for climate. But going back to one of my earlier answers, I think it's less obvious sometimes what the thing is that they need to do. So the other lesson that's clear and behavioral scientists, of course, have talked about this a lot is clear, consistent messaging. And really sticking to things and being prepared where necessary to mandate things. And when you're not mandating them, be very clear what it is you expect people to do. So I think clarity of messaging is going to be important. And of course, there are all sorts of other things in the climate space that are going to make a difference. You've already mentioned one of them, affordability. You know, it's just a reality. If it's affordable, you do it. If it's not, you don't. Can you make the green choices easier than the non-green choices? Can you make them cheaper than the non-green choices? Are there nudge techniques you can use to try and get people to do things um, and move in the right direction? You know, we still know that people aren't rushing. I mean, although electric vehicles are increasing quite a lot and they'll, they'll definitely get there, you know, people have still got anxieties about whether it's got the right range and whether they've got the right charging points and whether the, um, um, uh, you know, the cost is going to be more than that. There are other cars. These are real things that, that I think um, are areas that can be dealt with both by technical answers and by behavioral um, answers and by clear communication. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, further questions. So what have we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic about ensuring that equity is considered in science-based policy? Yeah, well, it's, it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, very early on, I can't remember exactly when now, but early on in 2020, I remember standing at the podium and saying, this is a virus that feeds on inequality and drives inequality. And that's true for every epidemic and every pandemic. You know, it seeks out the most vulnerable, it seeks out those most marginalized, it seeks out those least able to um, cope. And that's where it has its biggest impact. And it then drives more people into that position. And there's a danger with any great societal transformation that the same thing will happen around climate change, you know, that. And we've touched on some of them here. If you can afford to get your air source heat pump, you, know, you feel good about it. But actually, that's no good if everyone else can't afford to get it. It's no good if we sort out um, renewable energies in the UK, but leave Africa unable to get energy through anything other than coal. You know, so upfront thinking about the implications of policy choices in terms of the ability to apply equitable access, think about disadvantage, think about the impact across society is important. And people think about that all the time. And I'm very impressed actually by policymakers and how they do think about that. But, you know, we, people get it wrong sometimes. I guess, especially with the climate crisis, because the link between um, action and impact is so distant. Yeah. It almost highlights those those inequalities more um, in a way. And yeah, I think it's definitely something that is going to be integral to any consideration, any agreement that we reach at COP26. Which sort of comes back as well to, to my opening point. This is a multidisciplinary scientific problem. You know, it's not engineering only. It's not physical sciences. It's social sciences. It's humanities. It's the whole thing that needs to come together in order to try and get the appropriate answers and make sure that we do this in the right way so that society can actually move on with it.
Yeah, definitely. We uh, heard from some of the IPCC lead authors in our event last week. And one of the takeaways was that one of the questions was, should we, should the IPCC be more advocative, be more policy orientated? Because it's not policy prescriptive. They just give the state of the climate and the lead author's responses were, no, it shouldn't. They don't want to be listened to. They're scientists. They're focused on climate science. That doesn't mean they know they have that multidisciplinary understanding of all the things that need to happen to reach these net zero targets to have effective climate action. Yeah. So uh, a further question. In Jane Fonda's new book, she discusses her decision making behind taking a flight across the country for a protest against climate and judging the risk reward benefit. How can individuals judge their own behavior in the face of these kinds of decisions, e.g. taking a flight to attend COP in Glasgow? I think it's incredibly difficult. I mean, there's no equation. You can plug it in and say, you know, this one makes sense. This one doesn't. I think it's uh, very difficult judgments. Um, I guess, you know, how do I think about it? I'm going to fly less for sure. And therefore I'm going to ask myself every time, is this a necessary flight or not? I'm not, I, I can't say I'm never going to fly again because I know that's not true. You know, do I hope that we get to uh, carbon neutral flight? Yes, I do. And I think there are some w ways to get there. Um, and we need to get that as soon as possible. And in the meantime, we need to be extremely cautious. But I, I just don't think it's an equation you can get to and say, you know, yes, this one's OK, because I believe the good I'm going to do is outweighing the risk. I mean, that's a personal judgment, but I, you know, it's not a mathematical judgment. Yeah, I guess it goes back to what we were talking about before about trying to make the right decision given these constraints, given, say, cost or affordability or things that need to happen. Or, for example, a lot of world leaders, a lot of delegation, delegates won't be able to get to COP26 by any other way through flying. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, there's, a, there's an argument, should, should the whole thing be virtual? Well, it's yeah. a different meeting if it's virtual. Um, yeah. uh, you've got similar arguments over, over cars. Um, you know, the embedded carbon in making a new car is quite high, as you know. So actually dumping all the cars you've got now and rich people all buying electric vehicles, increasing the output is probably not a very sensible answer, actually. You need to transition to it so that everyone can get there. But you've got to remember the embedded carbon as well as the carbon use. So I think there's there are lots of things here that, that, um, that, that are difficult equations that we're going to live through over the next decade and longer with the choice. And I do think this next decade is, is crucially important to get this right. And I say the R&D in this next decade is really, really important because it's going to start giving us the options and the, and the routes that we might, we might take. And we're going to have to make difficult choices individually. Definitely, yeah. I think it's going to be important to have, working out those tools in our arsenal to get to these net zero targets. Um, we touched upon... Um, COP and whether it should be should have been virtual and this kind of feeds into the next question so COVID restrictions have unfortunately resulted in many delegations particularly from countries without widespread vaccine access unable to attend COP how can we assure an inclusive COP in light of this context yeah it's difficult and and look it, it's far from perfect to, to have to do this um we've got difficulty with people traveling um I think there's some vaccine provisions that have been put in place for people coming um, but it's, you know, it's not perfect. I think the answer, I think, uh, is, is to make sure that that inequality is recognised and people really deal with it in the sessions and make sure that um, it doesn't become exclusive in the way it gets the answer. But I mean, it's, it's not perfect, for sure. And it's not, you know, one can hope that the next time there's a cop, these situations don't exist. But I guess we've all learned and it's, it's worth just thinking about this. We've all managed perfectly well in a virtual world, actually. Um, I mean, this meeting, it, it's fine. We, 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 it's working. And this would not have been what we did two years ago. You know, it would have been a face-to-face -face meeting. And we could have done this two years ago. Yeah. And we chose not to do this two years ago. I you know, I'm tot uh, not totally, but I'm much more paperless now than I was two years ago. 
I could have done it two years ago. I didn't. I didn't do it. And so I think I think we've been forced to do things which are actually good in terms of climate and and our approach to net zero, and accelerated that. And I think the challenge for us in a way is to keep that sort of pressure on ourselves to keep accelerating that change, which has been forced upon us by um, COVID. Definitely, yeah. I know for many firms that spent years about thinking how to transition to yeah. hybrid or online, and then. When that crisis hits, you have to. You're not going to be able to cope otherwise. Um, so it's, I guess, as you say, a, a case of keeping up that pressure, keeping up that that need to change and modify our behaviours um, in accordance with the climate crisis and to reach those net zero targets. That's brilliant. I'm very conscious of the time and that is coming close to six o'clock. Um, so I just want to say a huge thanks to you, Patrick, for providing such an interesting insight into the challenges and opportunities that we're facing in learning from the response to COVID-19 pandemic for climate action. Um, I hope our audience, you've really enjoyed tonight's event. Um, I know myself, it's been incredibly interesting and I've really enjoyed discussing these topics with you. So next Monday, we'll be welcoming Finn Harris and Anthony Lazarutz to talk about climate communications. Very important, as, as we've mentioned in this evening's event, and they'll be beginning at 7 p.m. Uh, it'll be streamed to YouTube, similarly to this event. And please see our Facebook and Eventbrite pages for more details on the event. And please make sure to sign up to our newsletter to keep up to date with all our other activities. With that, I'll bring our event to a close. I hope everyone's enjoyed and have a nice rest of the evening. Thanks, Luke. And uh, it's all up to you now, your generation. OK, sort it out.